as uh, for those who attended uh, some, or uh, some of us attended many of the work sessions, um, jumping ahead a little bit, it is the case that many, many issues deal with this topic that Martin starts with, land, uh, land use. Uh, and I think I would like to make a suggestion, which I hope is constructive, to frame uh, so many of the individual topics that are going to be coming up um, in the course of this dialogue and that are buried in the uh, comprehensive plan, not buried, they're <coughs> woven into the comprehensive plan. Um, and I think it reflects um, a, an opportunity to reframe things that will be more meaningful. And I, I prepared a few maps. Uh, this was a 10-month process and I attended almost all of them. I hope you'll give me five minutes, uh, three minutes to organize will reorganize the framework of the, of the discussion a little bit so that these things can fit in. All county will all know and love. We've seen these maps of, of, of various manifestations many times. It looks pretty organized. Second map. Because the, the circumstance is we all know our county so intimately, we sometimes deal with issues without stepping back. In other words, we're dealing with individual trees and don't, don't talk about the forest. This is that same map with a highlight of a particular geographic uh, element in this county, which is the peninsula. There was more than one peninsula in this county, but that's the Route 33 uh, Peninsula, which uh, is the top particular topic uh, that I want to deal with, because truthfully, so many of the things we've talked about in this comp, comp plan, as I'm sure the counselors would agree, uh, deal with Western uh, the western villages and things that are happening on that piece of ground. That's that same peninsula straightened out. A uh, little pair of scissors, look, look, look. And uh, we all know this. I mean, they're, they're, this is, I'm not making any surprises here. Next map. That's the circumstance, that's the distance of, uh, as reflected, that's the reality of the length of that peninsula in Maryland geography. It'll take you to Annapolis, it'll take you well into Delaware, uh, it'll take you up to uh, Kent Pat County. I, I would like this conversation to have in mind this schematic map, because on that peninsula already lives, before any changes to today's existing code, 20% of the population, um, 12 of the 22 villages, two sewer plants, that is a single road from 322 out the, the other way, which is a minor artery and a collector road. It will never be broadened. One way in, one way out, every vehicle, automobile, truck. And those are the reasons why the, I believe, the, the citizens I've talked to are so concerned about the uh, body of the comprehensive plan. Uh, reflected on the land use is the transportation chapter in the plan um, and where, where I find a very significant uh, disconnect in the plan as it's presently structured uh, is that between uh, and among the land use provisions uh, the transportation section and to some degree the economic development section and what do I mean by that well those those areas of plan I think should be more interrelated than they are uh, and I think there's some inherent conflict in the way the plan is laid out now uh, among those uh, several elements. Um, and you, you can take the transportation side and look at the reality of, for example, the Route 33 corridor, where uh, we now know we start out with, because we counted, this county had a, had a traffic study done 10 years ago that found that St. Michael's Road was already failing at a level D. Uh, and projected it would not get any better than that into the future. And that was before um, we've now added to it all the development at the Waterside Village. Uh, EJ's is coming, the Teeter is coming, um, uh, Dix is already there, Moore is going to come there. Um, we then have um, uh, recently plans to double um, Perry Cabin in size to triple Martingham in size. We're, we're trying to emphasize bringing more tourism into St. Michael, at least the merchants down there are, rightly so. But the, the Maritime Museum is expanding. They want to attract more people there. They want to bring tourists from Oxford on Bellevue Road. 
where, how are we going to accommodate all of this? There's nothing in the plan that talks about that. Uh, we know the roads are already unable to handle a large part of the year what, what they're, they're uh, exposed to. Um, but we have all this development we know is coming. And then on top of that, we're now talking about in the land use section, intensifying the development on this peninsula through more intense um, density in the villages. It was an effort by some of the council members to say, let's talk about what these densities should be, but this was resisted by the council as something we'll address later on. I don't think it can address it later on because it pertains to what the plan should be saying about how you are going to accommodate all this increased density, increased development with roads that are not going to change. Route 33 is not going to change. Route 329 is not going to change. Um, how, how do we handle that? Um, I, I could go into some length about this, but I won't out of respect for the other people here, but I don't think there's a, a, a real correlation among the objectives of the land use section the proposed growth and development we are projecting with sewer coming to all the villages in the western section, all the villages now. Um, what that will mean once we increase density, once we allow more subdivisions perhaps, uh, once we have sewer to lots that don't perk now that we can then develop with sewer. And then on top of that you have all the commercial development I've just described and we have roads that are not going to change. Um, like with our, our heritage as farmers and all that, we, we hate to see uh, loss of farmland and, and uh, we lament we lament the way things were, but we understand the growth. So uh, infill, yes, that's that's our favorite. You know, just as you explained, we'd like to fill that. And the peripheral, uh, my experience nine years on a critical area, you don't have a lot to worry. I live in Tunis Mills, a town that's pretty much protected. I mean, you might have a couple more lots in the town anything on the peripheral is pretty much zoned another zone um, or it's going to be one in 20 and if you were going, ever going to get any higher density than that in any of these villages you're going to need growth allocation from the critical area commission you're not going to get that probably you're, you might get it for oxford st michael's and you're not going to get it for the villages is what i see because it's you know they're so small and I, I just don't see that coming so i don't have those fears and where i live and uh, probably where some of these other villages are, um, are on the water and in the critical area, it's going to, it's already been tamped down. I don't think you're gonna have that, those fears of, of the peripheral development outside these. It's only gonna be minimal. Uh, in Tunis Mills, the few homes that are built in the outer edges, you know, are already restricted by the one in 20, by the lots. It's already been done, it's a done deal. So I don't, I don't have a whole lot of fears. I've looked at it pretty hard, and, and about one DU, one right per acre works, following up on what Mike said. The time you put in uh, the storm water, the critical area is going to be involved in everything else. You're not going to yield any more than that anyway. Uh, but that seemed, would seem like a fair amount if you did have 20 acres that happen to be in the center of the village. Uh, 20, if you guys were ever in mind to approve duplexes or townhouse types of things, which maybe you are, maybe not you would then cluster them up anyway and have a lot of open space, park, whatever left. So, again, to Laura's question, that's my feeling on it. Uh, one and right break, has now, certainly not four rights break, because I don't think it's realistic to believe you would ever utilize them anyway. Thanks. In response to Ms. Price's question about infill and, and peripheral development, from the conversations I've had with people in the villages, they're, they're perfectly okay with infill development in the villages. But they're not quite so sanguine about peripheral development because they're, they're not sure what it means to them uh, in most of the buildings. But I think the question, the wrong question to start with, I mean, the question you ought to start with is how many more, how much more development could you stand in that 33 quarter? 200 houses, 100 houses, 50 houses? before you outstrip the capacity of the emergency response folks to take care of it, before you outstrip the capacity of the smaller roads, like the one that goes through Royal Oak, to, to uh, handle additional traffic. And if there's an impact on the schools, an impact on school bus traffic, and, and a whole bunch of infrastructure issues that I think 
the, the comprehensive plan doesn't effectively deal with, or doesn't deal with as effectively as I think it could. Um, but I think you need to think about those things and come up with a number. I mean, you can do analysis of carrying capacity of, of things like these roads and, and, and the infrastructure and the emergency response system. You can hire a firm and they'll give you that number. And you can qualify it all kinds of different ways, but it's probably not 200. Well, we, we have trouble getting out of St. Michael's during the summertime now. And God forbid there's ever an accident in St. Michael's, which is a state highway that requires the state officials to come and do their accident investigation, which the last time I was involved in an accident on 33 down by Whitman, took three hours. So all of us who were trying to get out of, out of uh, Tillman sat there for three hours after the state officials came while they did their investigation. Well, if that happened during the peak of the summer tourist season, when we were trying to get through, or, or if there was a, a, a weather emergency and that happened, it could be a disaster in which people lost their There's considerably more traffic now, but I have seen, it appears to me that uh, over the last 10-ish years that the development pressure has subsided between market forces, overriding state law that has prevented uh, septic systems in many areas. I mean, it's, it's just so difficult to subdivide land now uh, that I see quite a bit of the pressure have abated. I mean, it was uh, high pressure in the 70s and 80s. I think some of your census data showed as far as home construction and home creation. Uh, but in the last 10 years, it has abated, and I'm on the road impeding traffic constantly with farm machinery, and it's, <laughs> it does not seem to me to be any worse now. Uh, maybe not as bad as it was in uh, 04, 05, 06. I think the tourism took a pretty good, a pretty good hit. Um, Tourism took a pretty good hit, and it's just now coming back. Uh, I don't see it as quite as dire as some other people would maybe. I just I, I've watched this over a long period of time, and I remember um, when the critical area law was coming in. There was a lot of development happening very quickly, but that uh, a lot of that's built out. I mean, a lot of that's over, and you're looking at the, the result from it. Um, there's a trend down that neck more towards second homes. A lot of homes that people lived in when I was a kid. Um, now there are people there maybe on weekends, uh, nobody there all winter. And there's a cottage industry of people riding around taking care of people's homes, making sure the heat's on during the winter and make sure the pool's taken care of and whatnot. So, I mean, that, that traffic to the, a lot of those homes has actually abated because the people are not full time. You know, that the area is limited to infill and we are missing um, housing in certain areas, especially affordable housing. There's a demand for affordable housing in Tulsa County. Um, we're looking at what's currently on the market as far as your bank owned properties, your foreclosed properties, where citizens can't get a loan uh, on those properties uh, because of the condition of the property. And I think as far as we're looking at infill, I think there's a demand for that market. I think that infill makes a great deal of sense. I share the concern about the safety issues, the infrastructure to support the landfill, and certainly any additional development. I think safety has to be a primary concern. Um, but I am an advocate of the infill development. But keeping in mind, I think the the suggestion that we have a density number and a study to arrive at a density number that the roads and our emergency services can handle is an excellent suggestion. What is about to change is that all of the sewers on those little blue dots on the peninsula, all the villages out there, I think the working hypothesis is that um, sewer lines in the period of this comp plan will be extended to all those villages, God willing, and it is a positive thing all for it. Um, but this council, I think no council is going to take away from any property owner the right to develop a, uh, a lot of record uh, that, uh, that qualifies today uh, for, uh, for development if it has sewer in, in there, or to preclude somebody from legally subdividing their land per the existing law before we talk about additional densities. So the truth is, I don't believe that anyone actually has compiled, though I'm sure the information is compiled whole, 
the, the number of lots that can't comprise the infill, that is, their, build, their buildable lots of record out in the villages, but for the fact that they don't perk today. So all of those in some period of time are going to be built, plus all those uh, individuals who own property and have the right to subdivide it at 20 plus 3. The aggregate of all those are homes that are going to uh, be built in, in some span of time on that peninsula where, as you were alluding, we have, we have daily issues having to do with you know, activities of daily life, trucks and traffic and what have you, much less the hazardous issues. So I believe that those uh, constraints are, have not been adequately recognized uh, and the equation that, that some people believe that, that if sewer is available, ergo we're going to have substantial additional development. Uh, and what is what during the course of this uh, comp plan renewal has terrified a lot of people, scare a lot of people, is not only the, the acknowledgement that the existing zoning in the villages is quarter acre zoning, but for the suspension, uh, there are also have also been uh, specific conversations about uh, uh, bonus dens uh, bonus density in the villages if sewer is available, and bonus density above that if there is workforce and affordable housing. These are issues, policies that are have been suggested and are, and are on the uh, table. Um, and there's a provision in the draft comprehensive plan that transfer of development rights, TDRs, can be um, achieved and transferred into villages or non-municipal areas. Um, also, <laughs> the illusion was the fact that the adjoining property next to the next to some of the villages is already zoned such that um, it's not going to be a problem. Well, remember, in the comprehensive plan exercise, those boundaries are not yet set. That is one of the tasks that this county council will do. And there are position, uh, properties, not, not, not every village is constrained. There are a number of villages that are on the other side of St. Michael's, where traffic is available, I mean, will be an issue of five and 10 and maybe 20 acre parcels that could be described now to be inside the boundary, and therefore it is infill development at who knows what density. It could be quarter acres, it could be quarter acres with bonus for, for affordable housing, and somebody could build by uh, uh, TDRs uh, to increase the development over that. Well, I've been in the real estate business for 40 years. When you mess it up, you can never unmess it. I, do, I don't think that the growth is going to be as substantial and, and, and as scary. And the school district in St. Michael's is well underutilized. Um, you have plenty of room for growth there. Um, 33 is, you're right, it, it is what it is. St. Michael's is 47% second homes right now, and I would venture a guess that a lot of that goes well beyond. All the way back to Laura's question when she asked is what do we think infill means? We don't know, because we're not answering the question of on that infill lot, are you going to allow it to be developed at the rate of four units per acre or, or one unit for two acres? Historically, once you have sewer, it's four units per acre. Are you going to be able to subdivide it? If you have 10 acres, can you subdivide it into 20 quarter acre lots? All infill, I'm talking about lots that are infill. We don't, we, we will not know what infill means in any effective way until we know what density is going to be applied. As you well know, uh, Council, uh, they're uh, looking to master plan the Port Street development project. And uh, as part of that, it's going to take a, a collaborative effort uh, between the town of Easton, Easton Economic Development, and the county uh, to work on that project. Uh, we'd like to see if we could, uh, and I'll send Martin some language, but work collaboratively with the town. Chalba County Economic Development Corporation will work, uh, Council will work collaboratively with the Town of Easton, Easton Economic Development Corporation to develop and implement an appropriate small area plan for Easton Point and Port Street uh, Corridor. 
we, uh, you know, we know there are multiple uses there. We want to keep some of those uses, the marine uses. I know there's concerns about keeping the channel open, and that's a very important piece of the project. And for those who have gone to the public hearings, uh, there's a plan to take where the boat ramp is now and move that over onto other property that the town of Easton would own. And so that would uh, create a better waterfront at the end of Port Street for maybe some uh, some restaurant development or something like that. Yeah, and we didn't, and I'm not asking you to support it, I'm asking you to work collaboratively. Well, yeah. yeah. That, because that's, that's, that's a conceptual plan that needs to go through many alliterations. Uh, we need to be able to, you know, the African American community uh, that lives on Port Street needs, is being involved in, in meetings. We need to make sure that people aren't displaced and, and the whole collab the whole plan is to create a co water corridor where people can actually bring their boats up and then come into the town of Easton. And then we're looking at you know other elements in the town to make sure that uh, we we have we have a corridor that we're all proud of, but also leads them from the water into the town. Uh, and and I agree with you, Mr. Bartlett. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. It's very very early conceptualized. Yeah, we've, we've spoken about it sort of in general terms. I think the, the consensus is generally that, yes, yeah, some sort of redevelopment there makes an awful lot of sense. What happens in the future, uh, the details will be um, interesting to see how they come about. We're talking about a very long-range plan that's driven as much by economics as planning it. And so it'd be hard today to sit down and say, this is exactly what's going to happen. You need a, at least a vision to start moving towards, and then it will evolve. So, um, but redevelopment of critical parts of our community like that is, I think, a, a lot of goal. Something, and, and I, I echo the comment: the more that we can work together between the towns and the county to do that effectively, the better off we all are. It's been great to see that process really come together. I would point out from an economic development standpoint, one of the key issues is certainly broadband. And uh, we offered some updates, we, the Economic Development Commission, and I believe the Chamber as well, offered some updates to the language earlier this year, some of which were included, many of which were overlooked. I want to clear up one common misperception. There is broadband coverage in all of the incorporated towns, I can't speak to Queenie, but in Easton, <coughs> St. Michael's, Oxford, and Trap. Okay. The definition from the FCC of broadband coverage is 25 megabit per second download speeds and 4 megabit per second upload speeds. We have those speeds as good as anywhere else in those areas that are provided by the cable system now in the uh, comp plan draft language here it says that the cable system is not adequate to do it and i'm not talking just about eastern cable and for point of disclosure i'm for eastern cable right my point there is to clear up the misperception that we don't have broadband services in the county because we do ourselves a huge disservice when we sit there and trumpet this now there's a lot of folks who have waterfront homes in very thinly settled area that don't have access to it. That's a function of economics. It's, it's expensive to lay the equipment out to get there. So there are areas and pockets that we need to work on and continue to develop and reach out to. But to create the perception that this county doesn't have adequate broadband services is not true. The, the plan should reference the fact that 50% of the population, 4550, live in municipalities. So that percent of the population actually does have access to high-speed broadband. And when someone looks at a comprehensive plan from outside of the community, you wouldn't want it to appear that 100% did not. So I think it maybe does need to reference that, that percentage of the county. It, it, I mean, it's 50%. It's and there is there are people outside of the municipalities that have access to, to Atlantic broadband also. So it probably would just be good to reference it when somebody looks at it without knowing that information, there's kind of an assumption when you read this that we don't have. I think what this points to is, the, in the question you started to ask, should we regulate this as a public utility? That gets into a much more complex and, and um, difficult legal consideration and economic consideration. But what the county can do 
and what the comprehensive plan should do is promote the expansion of the infrastructure necessary to make this happen. It all works across fiber optics. Even the cellular stuff, the fiber optic line has to go into that tower. The tower gets a signal, drops it down, eventually gets it on, on uh, fiber optics. So what we can do to expand the availability and the opportunity of broadband, of uh, fiber optic in infrastructure will go a long way we're starting to fill in those remaining gaps. This, the comprehensive plan does make some, we ought to all be cognizant of the uh, uh, substantial growth in tourism in the direction of St. Michael's with the increase of uh, at the Maritime Museum, the big capital campaign. Uh, the SPAR program is going to trigger the uh, redevelopment, which I think everyone welcomes, of uh, Martingham and, uh, and, and, and that project. And uh, there's a lot of work going to spur tourist, tourism uh, down in that district, which um, these of the being down in the weeds of uh, some of these important issues, uh, I'd I, I really would like to talk about a couple of aspects of development along the peninsula out to and beyond um, St. Michael's. We heard from uh, Ray Clark at length about sewer extension issues on that peninsula and beyond, there was scant discussion of um, hazard, hazard mitigation issues. Uh, I don't remember that the council or any of us looked at, for example, uh, hurricane storm surge uh, maps. Uh, the discussion of hazard mitigation was uh, de minimis, and yet, um, uh, 20% you know, of our population is already out there. It's been grilled because of the inflow and peripheral work we've been talking about. We've got tourists by uh, the bucket loads out there at part, not part of the year. Um, and uh, it, the hazard mitigation business is very important to me. One of, uh, one of the maps that is not going to go up, no doubt, uh, shows, in fact, the 12 or 13 individual points along that peninsula, if you remember that diagram, between on the peninsula, which are identified with by the Talbot County um, Department of Public Works, I believe, as low spots up for flooding. And the flood, the hazardous, um, uh, what did I say, the surge maps uh, for that peninsula, which is a God-given aspect, it's the fundamental aspect of what shapes Talbot County and isn't sufficiently dealt with. Those flood, those uh, surge maps would terrify anyone who looks at, at them. And yet we did not hear, I, I believe, in any of the work sessions. I would have loved to hurt, have had a presentation by uh, our Department of Emergency Services on those issues having to do with hazard mitigation. But hazard mitigation was dealt with in about three minutes in the, on the March 16th session and it wasn't substantive. And then we got past that and started talking about nothing but sewers. And, and it's been the uh, Tulsa County uh, Tourism Board, and uh, they've asked me to uh, articulate a couple of different things that they would like you to consider for the plan. Uh, when uh, when uh, they wanted a on the, the county uh, land use policies. Uh, they would like to see in certain areas where the county council deems redevelopment to be appropriate, the county should provide greater design flexibility for redevelopment projects that will allow for the improvement or replacement of functionally obsolescent structures and uses. Uh, under the economic development policies, and Martin, I'll make, give you a copy of this so you can circulate it to the council. Uh, the county should support the appropriate enhancement of existing uses and or structures that contribute positively to the county's economic base. Uh, under the tourism policies listed on 7-6, the county should support and encourage the appropriate enhancement of existing tourism-related uses and structures. Also, in talking with Cassandra, we hope that the, the newest data that is available from the state is used in the comprehensive plan. I think we've used 2012 data. There's some 2013 and 14 will be coming out uh, relatively soon. Uh, also an acknowledgement uh, of stories of the Chesapeake uh, and our involvement with them and some of, some of the other programs uh, that we, uh, we work on uh, with the heritage areas. Uh, so uh, 
we'll get you the appropriate language so you can look at that as a council and make a decision if you want to incorporate that. I, I do not understand why uh, in the economic development section of the plan, um, there is no mention anywhere of the most critical economic driver of our county, which is the hospital. Um, it employs 2,000 people. Um, its plans for the future are uncertain at best, from what I can tell, although you may be privy to more confidential information on those plans. But the only way place that the hospital is mentioned is back in the, the paragraph in red, 4-9, uh, in the healthcare section, which says that uh, you know they bought the property 225 acres. Um, they will commence planning and design of a hospital within five years. We've been hearing that for already almost 10 years. Um, and if they don't complete a hospital within 15 years, I guess from now, uh, the county could emphasize could require the hospital to convey the property back. And, and I don't understand why our plan wouldn't. Um, more affirmatively attempt to, uh, more firmly propose that the county try to engage with the hospital representative, the hospital leadership, and try to continue to push them towards either developing a hospital on that site or coming out and saying, we're not going to do it and put some money into the hospital that we have here in town instead. And it's too critical, it seems to me, just to ignore this whole issue when it's the real centerpiece of economic growth in this county. I think the county should, should continue to engage. We, it, it's all the we history are. out there about what's going on. We, we are, but you're saying to take that language and put it in here. I think it should be part of our plan to, okay. to continue could you, to do could that. Could you write, send, you be mind if not, we can go ahead and I'd be happy to okay. uh, write something up. Send it over to our Senate team. That's right. And, uh, the hospital is not the sum total of the health care system. Right. It's, it's, it's far broader than just the hospital, and there's a regional aspect to the whole thing. So, so yeah, the hospital question is certainly a, a, a critical question that's been circulating around, but, you know, it's the largest, the healthcare system is the largest employment sector. Well, that, those points are, are, are well, well taken because certainly the hospital generates, there's a multiplier effect throughout the economy based upon medical office buildings and technology com technical companies that support the hospital. But if that hospital is you know, picked up and tried to do what they tried to do 10 years ago, move up to Queen Anne's County somewhere, you know, that whole house comes tumbling down. There was in the, um, not plan discussions and transcripts here, discussions that describe the deal between the county, the town, and the um, and the hospital. Uh, and, it, and it was expressed uh, pretty firmly that that deal was negotiated on the basis that, it, that the hospital had a period of time, 10 years, I've heard 15 years, to actually get that hospital built. And if it didn't happen, the, the sin qua non of that deal was that it would reverse and uh, there were a number of steps, it's very complicated, as Mr. Bullen explained, but that that transaction would, would be rescinded. But what came out in the red line version, and my question is, is this what you all really intended? Is It says if construction is not substantially completed within 15 years, the county could require the hospital to convey back the property. And I ask that because if this is expressed that in, in such a manner that it the county could ask for it back. That is the first step on an assured path, in my opinion, to the property actually, should the hospital not be built. Let's hope it's built. But if it isn't, it will turn into a big shot. Well, I it, believe it, it should it, be expressed. It's, not, it's, not, it's zoned as a medical regional center, and that's the only purpose currently that it can be built. It's right. owned by the hospital. It's already a part of the town. It's been annexed. The town controls the zoning. Correct. Yeah, under the development agreement, the county has a contractual right to to We re could object if, 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 if a town council 20 years from now, if a town council 20 years from now wanted to rezone, rezone that from the medical, the current county council 20 years from now could certainly object to that because that was not the intent and purpose of that property. But, Yes. That, that's really my question. I, I, my question is, don't you really want to say 
that the count that this comprehensive plan is that should the count the hospital not get built, God forbid, but should it not, this plan is that our county council will exercise its 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 rights to the maximum extent to effect the original intent, which is the repurchase and and uh, reversion of that property to this to the status received.